My name is Mancha Jawara. I'm a professor of comparative literature and film at New York University, New York. I was born in Mali and grew up in Guinea. Uh, this is very important because this is, you know, this is the moment when Africa was coming to independence, decolonization. And uh, Mali, Guinea, Ghana, they belonged to a block together. Uh, they wanted to become one country. I went to school only after Guinea became independent. And, uh, and it was because of Sekuture. You know, he basically said, oh, everybody has to go to school if you want to build a nation. Nation building was really huge. Politically, I think my mind was shaped. My mind was shaped in a sense that I was thinking the way Sekuture was thinking about the world. I came to the U.S. and went to the American University. But uh, what was interesting about it is that I took my first Black Studies class there took my first black class, studies class, and he had to realize that black studies started in the U.S. in 1969. People just came to schools. The same kind of revolutionary uh, thought that shaped my mind in Africa. With the, they just said, we're taking over the university. You have to create a black studies. So I took a class as an African coming from Paris in a very ironic manner. What, what are these people going to teach us? What's, what do they want? And so on. But, but I took the class, I met Fanon again. They were teaching Fanon because Fanon accompanied the Black Power Movement in the US. It was the most read book, along with Mao's uh, Red Book. Then when they, uh, Black people took over the universities, specifically in places like Cornell University, City College in New York. They again brought Fanon, Fanon from the street to Fanon in the university. This is important because in the 80s and 90s, suddenly when post-structuralists came, they brought Fanon back again. Omi Baba, Gayatri Spivak, Edward Said. Those moments again, I was more a kind of, like a character in a building's roman. I was going through things that I didn't understand, but I was learning. So if you take life as a novel, I was that naive character in Guinea, in Mali, in France, all the way to Washington, D.C. It's a difficult question because I love Rouge and Rouge also loved me. So it's a difficult question because my experience with Rouge didn't bring me same neither from the Africans nor the anthropologists. The African thought that I didn't hit hard enough, and the anthropologists thought that I didn't know Rush. But Rush taught me, and Rush authorized me in a situation that where he will not have let anybody else make a, a film on him. Every time I speak about him, I may not reach exactly what I want to say. The situation with, with Rouge for me is the following. First, of course, he's the father of cinema verity. And Rouge always used to tell me, Rouge loved Ziga Bertolt. Bertolt for him was the filmmaker, you know, uh, the kino, the, the camera eye. And he said, well, I have to always remember cinema verity that the truth is the truth in cinema. It's not truth in reality. Bertolt taught him that. So, what Rush was doing, uh, of course, they don't tell people what clothes to wear, what, you know, where to sit, the mise-en-scene and all these things, but it was still cinema, and it was still looking for the truth of that cinema. This was very important to, to, to Jean Rouge. When I was growing up in Africa, our identities were really shaped by cinema. You know, uh, Eddie Constantine, uh, people like uh, Edward J. Robinson, uh, Humphrey Bogart, and so on. Uh, and that's why Sam Ben Usman, by the way, said that Jean Rouge's Moyen Noir is his favorite film. Jean Rouge dit qu'il est fier du fait que tu dis toujours que ton film préféré c'est Moyen Noir. Eh oui, parce qu'il faut analyser Moyen Noir. C'est la perte de l'Indien totale. 
tous ces jeunes veulent, se res, veulent ressembler à Edward J. Robinson, à Tarzan, à Annabella, à Rudolf Valentino. C'est qu'ils n'ont pas de référence chez eux. Les seules références, c'est le cinéma, les acteurs de cinéma. Quand bien même ils ne connaissent pas ces sociétés, quand bien même ils ne savent pas comment se, est conçu un scénario. Et le cinéma les a marqués. Dans la perte de l'identité, c'est le meilleur film qui a été fait. I came to cinema really because the people I admired were filmmakers, but they were not doing what I wanted to do in film. Uh, because I, I'm perpetually this alienated person. <laughs> the person who is not a perfect French, who is not a perfect English, who is not a perfect uh, Soninke, Mandingo, uh, or Bambara. I speak all these languages, but I'm inadequate in all of them. And cinema really gives me that, that chance to be in front of the camera and have nothing behind me to be as vulnerable as possible. For the Biennale, the opportunity that you gave me, that, that's amazing, uh, for the 34th edition of the San Paolo Biennale, uh, to, to look at all these people that I have been name dropping throughout our conversation, and then know that they are different, and they're very different, uh, but put them in a relation, put them in a conversation, put them in a conversation in a way that one does not seem smarter than the other one, but in a way that the conversation will change, well, at least will elevate that conversation to another level that it would not have reached if like-minded people had been talking to each other. But now that you have differences talking to, when you assemble differences, Glissant always says, then you are creating. He always said that, Beauty is the reassembly of differences. And then he always says, rien n'est vrai, tout est vivant. Nothing is true, everything is alive when you add differences together. Because Negritude believed a lot in uh, mysticism, in darkness, in black is beautiful, you know, borrowing from Harlem Renaissance all the way to, to, to the Black liberation movements. And that they, on the other hand, Fanon was always saying that for a rational man, there is nothing as maddening as mind boggling. There is nothing that will drive a rational man uh, crazy than to be confronted with irrationality. Richard was irrational. So Fanon just said, it drove me crazy. So Fanon used the word at that time, I, I, I realized this much later, but he used the word that we have to deopacify life. And you can see why Glissant will come to that later. <laughs> Il faut désopacifier la vie. I tell people, Fanon taught me how to think, like I said earlier, and Glissant liberated me. And his response to the negative movement by proposing creolization as opposed to creolité, creolization, which is a mixing with unpredictable result. You mix things, but you can't predict what the result is going to be. This unintended result is very important to listen. Creolization is a mixing without knowing the final result. So you can't stop it. When you stop it, then to follow your, your metaphor for the Biennale, Glissant always said that, uh, many people say this, but Glissant always said that when a work is finished, he's no longer interested in it. It's the process, it's the, the making of the work, where you see a line here, you see a sparkle here, where the imaginary is trying to, to, to accomplish something, to grasp something, and missing it. That's what's important to Gleason. Gleason also says something that, to come closer to your team, Gleason said that the echo of every voice is important to, to hear. We have to hear every voice. If we don't hear an echo of a voice, this is this why the singing is important. In classes, we read about the ring shout. 
you know, the, the, the fugitive blacks, the Maroon, the Quilombos, they, they, used, they used to do a shout which went through the night that people hear, but it was a message in, in many ways. I didn't make much of that until the death of uh, the killing, the murder of George Floyd. Because if you look at black struggle, if you look at Black Lives Matter, if you look at all the way from way back, uh, Frederick Douglass, they are struggling. And many black leaders have well, liberation rebels, let's put it this way, have helped to make that voice heard, the black voice heard. But George Floyd is just saying, I can't breathe. And that message translated so much better than any discourse, than any other thing around the world. Of course, there was the image there. But that, that echo of his voice, that singing in prison, that singing in darkness, echoing around the world. Glissa always said that darkness, he considered darkness as an element of opacity because it's resistance. Darkness to him is resistance. It's not, it's an element, it's, it doesn't encompass all opacity because there is opacity in the light for Gleason. You know, you can have all the lights, but it's opaque. So darkness, therefore, is an element of resistance. And the way he played with voices coming from that darkness or light sparkling from that darkness makes your title abundantly uh, poetic makes it poetic because if something is clear and it can create debate it's not interesting to to, to listen so really i think your your, your title i know there is this enlightenment thing that you worried about but it's already been debunked it's been debunked by mudimbe it's been debunked by oh, so many authors even paul gilroy uh, enlightenment has been criticized, and that's what's good about enlightenment because it can be criticized and still remain useful. There are a lot of ideas can be criticized. If, it, if I debunk them, then they're dead. But modernity is useful. Modernity is useful. What is now useful about modernity is Eurocentric trying to own it and say, so this is, you know, comprend pas. This is the only way you have to do it. You got to understand, you got to do this. No, modernity is for all of us to come and manipulate it and get to places and liberate more spaces.